Welcome back. This is from Startup to Grown Up. My name is Alyssa Cohn, and today I'm thrilled to have Jake Cloberdance on the podcast. Jake is the co-founder and CEO of One Hope Winery. One Hope is one of the largest direct-to-consumer wineries in the world and has proudly donated over $10 million to local and global causes. And that's why I wanted to have Jake on the podcast. Jake originally had the idea of creating a wine that gives back, what he called Girl Scout Cookies for Adults, back in 2005. We talked about how he had that idea, how that idea evolved, and how he ultimately founded his company with a total of eight co-founders. So obviously, I was very curious with the dynamics of that. Jake and I also talked about how his vision and the business model have grown over the years. And since it's a brand about purpose, the importance of assessing values in his employees and also his investors. We discussed the power and importance of storytelling, the hardest experiences that Jake has dealt with in the growth of his business, and the surprising thing that Jake wished he had known earlier on his journey. I want to give a special thanks to Lindsay and Mark Goffman, who invited me out to Napa for a fantastic weekend and introduced me to Jake. Now, please enjoy my great conversation with Jake Cloberdance, the co-founder and CEO of One Hope Winery. Jake, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you join me today. Thanks, Alyssa. I'm excited to join you too. Then thanks for having me on. I'm so thrilled to have you on. And it was such a delight to meet you through um, Lindsay and Mark Goffman after a beautiful weekend up at your beautiful uh, winery. And I, I want to, so first of all, I want to thank Lindsay and, and Mark for introducing us and for that wonderful weekend. But also, you know, I really discovered One Hope and what you guys are doing there. So tell us about the founding story of, of the, whole, the whole shebang of One Hope. Yeah, our founding story goes all the way back to uh, 2005. And really, it goes back even further than that, because I have uh, the luxury of being um, uh, around uh, entrepreneurs going back generations. My grandma was the first entrepreneur in our family. And my mom followed in her footsteps and was uh, all of my life that I can remember as well. Um, but the start of One Hope um, begins in 2005 when I'm uh, getting my first job out of college with uh, a, a small little boutique winery you might have heard of uh, by the name of Gallo. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, the, the largest uh, wine company in the world and still family owned and a, a great place to learn about wine, especially from a guy growing up in the East Bay with no family background in wine. And so I got started with them. Um, I was going to UC Berkeley at the time and all they had to do was offer me the sales position down in Newport Beach. And I was like, yes. So oh, that's score. My, <laughs> score, exactly. That's where my uh, wine career started. And I um, kind of envisioned it being like white tablecloth, uh, high-end restaurant, uh, wine sales. In re reality, I was in the Ralph's and uh, Pavilions and Stater Brothers grocery stores doing manual labor to get the best display spots to put my wine in there. And I was stocking shelves one day and, and saw a can of Campbell's soup with a pink ribbon on it. And it said, this can helps in the fight against breast cancer. And no more than like 10 minutes later, I'm stocking Yo Play yogurt. And just like that can of soup, it's totally blown out. And the Dannon's totally filled up and the, the Yo Play yogurt, there's none of it left. And I see that their lids have this pink uh, ribbon on it and it says, um, send this lid in and it donates towards breast cancer. And so that was the initial idea is I'm going to build a wine brand that gives back. And then when I saw breast cancer awareness month, um, come and go in October, the idea kind of evolved into, um, I'm going to give back, but not just a month out of the year into one cause. I'm going to give back to lots of causes in year round and, uh, had this great idea and did what most people do when they have a great idea. Uh, which is nothing. So I did that for about six months. And then that's what really inspired me is uh, a phone call that I got from uh, one of my close friends growing up. And um, yeah, I'll share a little bit more about that if, you, if you'd like. Yeah, of course. I, well, but before you do that, when you say that, like, were you sitting there stocking shelves, you seeing these pink ribbons and thinking, I want to build a company one day that gives back every day. Or were you thinking, I want to build a wine company that gives back every day? Or what, what yeah. was the wine idea part of the process then? It, it was because right after that, I was going to the wine aisle and like dusting bottles and you would take care of all of your brands that were there. And so I was selling wine at the time and wine was my focus. So even though I was helping the liquor manager and store manager with 
uh, you know, all the grunt labor and stuff, which was my strength at that time as a salesperson was to move heavy things. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I definitely immediately, um, looked at that uh, idea of giving back. Um, and at that time, temporary marketing campaign that these companies were doing and said, this should be applied to the wine um, space because I hadn't seen any wine brands that were doing that. I see. Got it. Got it. Okay. So take us back to that call you got from your friend. Yeah. So, so I had this idea for six months, idea of building a wine brand that we'd give back. And the original vision was um, to build the adult version of Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> I love it. That's how I would describe it. And, um, and so I talked to a few people about it and stuff. And um, I got this call April 2006 um, from one of my best friends growing up. And she was a guy's gal growing up. I don't even know if that's a real phrase anymore. But she, she hung out with all the boys and was like great at sports. And she was my first uh, friend girl, you know, so not girlfriend, but friend girl. Yeah. And, uh, uh, her name is Morgan and she called me and her, her voice was kind of trembling and I could tell something was wrong. And, um, she, she went on to tell me, Hey, you know, I have, um, I just found out I have blood cancer and, um, it's going to be a really tough 15 weeks in front of me. I'm starting treatment this next week. And, um, I, I said, well, I'm going to come see you. Um, and I got on a plane the next day and uh, flew home to see her, um, went back to my old neighborhood and to her parents' house. And, um, you know, there's not much, uh, at that time near, I mean, I'm 22 at the time and there's, uh, not a lot of wisdom that I had to offer, but I knew that maybe I could inspire her by sharing about this idea I had that I thought could help a lot of people. And so I told her about, um, the vision for one hope and that I was going to start it while she was going through her chemo and radiation and that we were going to check in with each other at the end of every week and, um, let each other know like kind of, uh, what, what kind of momentum we gained that week or not gained, you know, and the tough stuff. And, uh, 15 weeks later, well, so the next day I fly home, um, and I incorporate one hope. So that's April, 2006. Mm -hmm. Um, and over the next 15 weeks, I find a winemaker to make our first few wines. I find a winery that'll let me make them there. And, uh, I file all the paperwork to get uh, a winery license. Um, and, uh, I file it for my parents' house in Fremont actually. So, <laughs> um, so that still was a bonded winery for a while, but, um, and, and by the end of those 15 weeks, uh, Morgan was cancer free and, uh, she has been, uh, since then. And, and she's, uh, she's got three kids. She's a teacher. She's doing great. So it was a happy ending to that story. Um, but, uh, it also sparked this great company and uh and allowed us to chase our purpose yeah well that's amazing that's amazing i'm so glad morgan's okay i have to say that would not be my reaction i mean i understand that you had something kind of in your head i can understand flying home to see your friend i guess i'm just really curious what was in your reaction that you said i know was it like we're going to do this together i'm going to do my hard thing and you're going to do your hard thing is it was that what it was or what were yeah, you thinking when I you said let's check money. in with each other yeah, I was raising money for um, breast cancer, AIDS, and autism. And I felt oh. like um, building a brand that was giving back and serving causes that were uh, in maybe in different, but uh, kind of parallel zone to what uh, the cause that she was being touched by um, would be exciting for her. And it, it did, it motivated her all the time. She thought it was cool. And to this day, she still texts me and is like, I'm so proud of One Hope. I'm so proud of what you guys have achieved. Things like that when we hit milestones or celebrate our anniversary and stuff. And so, you know, it wasn't until about nine months later that I'm uh, picking up the first wine in a U-Haul truck uh, and three pallets of it and driving it down to El Segundo, California to load it up in a public storage unit and start selling out of the back of our car. So there's a bunch of other twists and turns, but it was really like the beginning of it and the first exciting kind of hundred days of starting the company. And I think it kept Morgan's mind on, um, you know, other things for us to talk about. She, but she would let me know an update and it was just a way of us having a cadence and checking in too. Um, I, I was inspired to nurse the future, you know, um, that, which has been our North star the entire time. We just, uh, used to take more words to explain it to people. And mm -hmm. I, um, I, when she called me and she had told me that and we were talking about it, it set in that 
wow, life is short, you know? And it, um, it scared the shit out of me, you know? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. at the same time, it made me realize life is short and it made me courageous and it made me want to be brave and, and, uh, live it. And so that was, she was inspiring me by what she was going through. And I think yeah. she knew that. And, um, so yeah, it, maybe it is a different reaction than some people would have that I was, I was inspired by my purpose and found my why and it connected to a lot of other things that, um, you know, led up to it and other milestones in my life when I look back now. Yeah. Well, I can, a lot of entrepreneurs, many, many founders, they have this idea like life should be like this, or here's this idea that should be in the world. Or they might think, hey, there's a great market for this and nobody's doing it. I want to do this. And some entrepreneurs, founders, plenty of them are like, if I do this, I'm going to make a lot of money. And then, you know, they can do whatever they want. It sounds like your why was very purpose-based. And I'm just wondering, where did that come from? It's just very unusual to be like, I know I want to, you know, really contribute to, you know, cancer and other kinds of causes. I think it, it came from uh, my grandmas. Both of them gave back in their community um, in a way that I observed just through osmosis growing up. Um, and then my mom, um, I have some core memories of my mom um, giving back and also um, just being uh, really in service to our community. And um, so I, first and foremost, I got to observe that in some of the most important people around me. And then I started volunteering um, in high school and built a couple of schools down in Mexico um, and uh, during spring break. And I um, went in college, I became our, our social chair and our philanthropy chair, my uh, last two years, uh, in my fraternity. And so I combined yeah. the two budgets and I, um, at every party we threw was a fundraiser and, uh, allowed us to throw more parties. And we also raised, uh, more money than the entire rest of the fraternity system that year, uh, through our philanthropy. And I got to go to the, uh, Oakland's children's hospital and drop off that big check with a bunch of the guys from our house. And, they took us to the pediatric cancer area of the hospital and showed us how we were impacting people's lives. And um, that was a, a, a big turning point for me in my life too. When I, would, I had just started business school, I um, was going to uh, a class that was about, um, uh, about integrity in businesses at the time because Enron had, was just going down and uh, yeah. There was uh, a bunch of uh, interesting things uh, happening at the same time. And I, um, it, and so they made all of us go to business ethics that summer before starting business school. So those two things were kind of intersecting. And I said, I want to build a business that has um, purpose, you know, woven into the fabric of it. And I, um, I also wanted to build a business to make an impact too. I knew that I wanted to build a business when um, I went to my mom's office when I was about like, eight or nine years old. And one of the women who worked for her for a long time came up to me and said, your mom has changed my life. Like my Ooh. whole family's life. We have a home because of her. And uh, just um, really impacted me when she had that talk with me. And it was the first time I remember really putting it together that it's not just like my mom's the boss, you know, but she's a leader and she's empowering people to have better lives by, by building something meaningful and a, and a good culture at her company. Yeah, we're so imprinted by what we see in childhood. That's really amazing. What what business was your mom in, by the way? Uh, she was in marketing research. So my grandma started a marketing research company way back in the day, um, right after my grandpa had returned from his second term in World War II. And yeah. uh, she would bring the, the women together in her neighborhood and have them test out cleaning products and home goods and things like that and would uh, take down that information and... She just calling it research at the time, but it ultimately became called market research. And then my mom did it um, as well on consumer products initially. And then um, ultimately, uh, her the business she started with her longtime partner, this woman Mimi, um, they ended up doing it for video games and hardware and software. And so I got to grow up kind of introduced to the latest and greatest technology, computers, video games because of doing um, 
you know, test studies with her group and, and ultimately working for her. So yeah, it's really that's fun. so fun. That's really yeah. fun. That's amazing. It was so, really cool watching um, her behind a two way mirror too, and doing a focus group and like seeing how people interact with brands and how they connect with certain brands and, and packaging and things like that. And so my love for um, marketing and brand and uh, the way that brands connect with people uh, came from that, as well as probably a lot of my interest in technology as well, which plays a, a major part in One Hope's business. So Yeah. Oh, I see. Well, and we want to definitely get to that, but you, you have this idea, you have the wine made. That's a whole other story. I mean, I can only imagine if anybody said to themselves right now, what were they doing to start a wine company? There must be a, a journey to that. We'd love to hear a little bit about that. But then you ultimately, if I'm not mistaken, you have eight, co- there are total eight co-founders that started the business and there are six still in the business. So how did you get from, from there, from this idea to, yeah. you know, founding the business with a bunch of people? Yeah. So, um, you know, April, 2007. So that was April, 2006 that I incorporate the company by April, 2007, I'm driving those first three pallets of wine down, loading them up in a public storage unit. I, uh, I, I've left Gallo by that time. Um, I share the news with uh, a handful of other people. Um, there were four men, four women in our kind of recruitment class that year. And um, all of them over the course of, you know, a, a small amount of time um, uh, leave to uh, come in and serve this purpose with me and chase this vision. And it was really an interesting phenomenon for all of us in our early 20s to take that leap together and start without uh, without much money in the bank to do it and just saying, hey, we have to immediately hunt to eat uh, and get out there and sell. So um, it was uh, uh, four, four men, four women, like I said, and today there's uh, three and three of us. So, uh, and four of us are day-to-day with the company and two of them are advisors and um, doing uh, one working on another business that kind of developed over the course of the, the past years. And, um, and one of them taking a little time off because she's got three little ones under five. So, yeah, got it. So you're saying that in your class, in your class of sort of people who started in the wine business with you as wine sales people, you said, Hey guys, I'm going to start my own thing. See ya. And one after another, they all said, Oh, by the way, can we join you? And also, wasn't Gallo kind of mad at you for poaching the entire class? (laughs) Yeah, it, um, I didn't like go out of my way to poach the entire class. I think what happened is a uh, uh, few of us, I invited a few people to, you know, start it with me and co-found it. And, um, and the, once it got out, a couple of the others that were there were like, Hey, I, I want in on this too. And so it naturally, it was, it was more organic than that, but yeah, they were a mm-hmm. little annoyed. Um, I got a couple calls from them. So. <laughs> but ultimately they, everybody sort of came together. I'm sure it all worked out. Yeah, they actually full circle Gallo uh, in their book, uh, Gallo Be Thy Name, uh, were mentioned as the second to last chapter. And it's like in a very positive light about how oh. to leave them and go off and start these other great wine brands. Yeah, that that's quite beautiful, like a breathing ground for, you know, great things. So what kinds of conversations, if any, did you have with this frankly, unwieldy group of co-founders. I mean, you know, one co-founder, two co-founders, maybe a total of four co-founders. There's a lot of people. What conversations did you have to make sure you're on the same page? Ooh, um, probably not enough early on. You know, I, I'm definitely, because all of us are um, generally, I would describe us as really nice people. Um, and uh, maybe some of us even people pleasers. Uh, having the tough conversations and the honest conversations was hard. Um, we hadn't developed those communication skills on how to be really candid with each other and, um, still communicate in a respectful way. And also it takes time to build trust, to have those kind of conversations. Um, yeah. over time, we learned that breaking near-term rapport is how you build long-term trust. And it's so important that you're willing to do that and you're willing to sit in that uh kind of uncomfortable tension sometimes i we call it hugging the cactus sometimes like taking on the conversation that nobody wants to have but um it's a much healthier and so yeah early on i'd say we we weren't great at it um and uh at the same time we were running off of hope and we were running off of excitement and adrenaline and all that stuff so 
that took us a long ways. And everybody was um, excited about uh, going out and representing the brand and believed in it. And so that that carried us in the early days. Um, and it would definitely wasn't our, our business acumen, our communication. I do uh, believe that people really trusted me as a leader um, to mm -hmm. jump in. And I think that was a common thread. And I think uh, we there was a lot of trust uh, amongst the team, but not necessarily as much as I would have liked amongst all the co-founders with each other. But I did always feel like they trusted in me and they trusted the vision and, and my ability to lead us. So. Oh, OK. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, when you so you just gave me two phrases that are very interesting, short term, like break short term rapport in order to have long term respect and then hugging the cactus. So, well, did you coin or break yeah. short term rapport to uh, build uh, long term trust? Even oh, long-term trust. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. I was trying to do the alliteration, but yes. yes. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, did you come up with these phrases or was this like you did some coaching or some like program that helped you with these phrases? Like those are very interesting. <laughs> that, that's actually a great question. Um, those phrases uh, have been um, taught to me by different coaches and I have done <clears throat> coaching in my life ranging from I, what I believe the greatest rugby coach of all time, and at least in the U.S., a guy named Jack Clark at uh, UC Berkeley, um, a, an amazing coach that's uh, built a, a national championship machine, right? All the way to business coaches. And um, I've gone to coaching and leadership academy as well. Um, and so, yeah, those are phrases that I picked up. Um, uh, other things for, for as far as on leadership that I've heard over time is, the, the most simple and concise definition of leadership is making those around you better and more productive. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard it described that way, you know, and when my, my coach told me that I said, oh, that is what leadership is. And so I'm, I'm really focused when you're trying to focus on leadership of what are you, how are you impacting the people around you? And I don't think yeah. people necessarily think of it that way always. So there's things like that that I had picked up uh, from people. Um, but it's you have a good year for kind of noticing that those are phrases that I've I've learned over time. Yeah. Well, I also think, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later with you, about you obviously being a natural storyteller. And I want to talk more about, you know, sort of language. But before we get there, again, like, what were the markers when you said, oh, I wish we trusted each other more to be able to, or that the team, sort of the, the co-founders trusted each other more, to have difficult conversations and we should have had more than we had. Was there like a, a moment where, or could you, could you describe a moment where things kind of went off the rails because maybe you didn't have those conversations or you recognized, wow, we don't have enough trust inside of the team. Like what, what were the markers to you that like, mm, we could have done better on that? Oh, wow. Uh, the, the big ones that stand out to me are actually in the early days are the two co-founders that ultimately um, needed to leave the company. Um, one of them I probably knew within the first two months and it took me two years um, to have that conversation. And when you don't have enough conversations leading up to the ultimate conversation, people are surprised, right? They're just shocked. <laughs> and even when you do, a lot of times people are surprised. And, um, and actually our, um, our other co-founder, um, that's no longer with the company, uh, it was 10 years in, um, and sometimes, you know, cultures evolve. And so it, what was right for the company at one point is no longer. And so, um, I think that's why it's so important that you're having uh, regular communication and regular cadence because things don't just sit static in a business, um, you're, you're changing as a business. Um, the team is changing who's trying to build the business. Um, the market is changing around you. And so these are all uh, things moving in different directions. And so it's really important to have a uh, direct conversation aware about where people are relative to the rest of that context, where people are relative to where the business needs them, where they are relative to where the environment is and the rest of the people around them. And I think that most of the conversations early on weren't the ones that needed to because 
the accountability at the time wasn't as high as it is now in the business. Um, but we were just kids yeah, at the time. And, and, uh, and we didn't have as much responsibility and accountability other than to one another. You know, none of us were married. None of us had kids. Um, today, the six of us have 12 children mm -hmm. and they're all married wow. and have great partners. And, um, and we have a, I have another one on the way in December and, uh, and my partner, Brandon has one as well. So we're going to have 14 kids. So I think that, um, the stakes weren't quite as high and the need for accountability wasn't quite as high. And so, um, and I think that a lot of times it was actually the little things. There's not like these big blow up things other than the couple that I told you about of like, ultimately that person wasn't right. And you take responsibility when you come to that point um, and say, hey, this didn't work out. It, was it them? Was it me? It's probably it's probably both of you. It's like the the relationship broke somewhere along the way. Um, but a lot of the times when these things come up, it's not that big blowout, you know, um, firework. It's little stuff building up, building up. And then yeah. hopefully you get to a breaking point. So. Yeah. And then you don't address it. You don't address it. And then yeah. it gets to a breaking point because you don't address it when it's small. Yes, that's right. And, yeah. and uh, they were always when things weren't working. It was always about accountability and communicating about, uh, expectations and, uh, and verifying and clarifying like what we were expecting from each other. And a lot yes. of times we weren't doing that. Like, Hey, I'm hearing you say this. Am I hearing you right? That's actually, um, it's a very simple thing to do after somebody shares with you. Cause a lot of times you realize, Oh, they heard me totally different than what I was uh, trying to communicate. And so that was where most of the breakdowns were. And some of that, um, starts because the people, you don't draw energy from communicating with that person. And you, you're not like looking forward to calling them when you're hopping into a long drive, you know, and when the communication is lost, then the whole, the thing breaks down always because communication and trust go hand in hand. So true. So true. So what processes do you have in your company right now? that helps make sure that you keep up communication, that you keep consistent cadence so that, you know, you make sure things are on track. Um, we, we use the OKR system. So objectives and, and key results and tying what we're trying to achieve to very specific and metric driven stuff. Um, we do, we, at, we have the 24 hour rule um, where if you share something that's like, heated or gossipy or whatever, you have to tell that person um, and and communicate with them within 24 hours of when you opened up and vented to somebody else. Oh, I think people use that with, you know, take that with a grain of salt. I don't think everybody is like, hey, I just told you this and I'm actually going to go and tell that person that. But I usually challenge people to it. I say that's kind of our commitment within, especially within our executive leadership team is like, if you have something that you want to tell me as the CEO, then you better be willing to gain the courage once you've thought through it. And um, I think it's important to vent sometimes because it's a, it's a people reaching out to be coached in a situation where they're frustrated or something like that. So you can either pile on as a, uh, if you want to be a, a, a friend, then you can pile on and stuff and, and play that game and run that racket with each other. But if you want to be a coach and a leader, then you interrupt that conversation and you say, okay, and how are you contributing to this? Um, one, like turn it and say, how are you contributing? Are you, if it's right. all them, it's rarely all them. And then yeah. you have to, now you have to uh, figure out how you want to frame this up and communicate with them in a, a candid and honest way. Yes, hundred percent. And I think that's so, I, I think it's a really powerful point that People think, oh, venting or maybe talking behind someone's back is bad. Not necessarily. It's actually helpful yeah. to frame your thoughts. And as you just said, get coaching and I think also expel the emotion. Yeah. And then the notion of like you having to go follow up, but also own your response. Once you kind of start, sort of expel that energy, you can recognize that you have some complicity in this dynamic as well. And also you haven't told them. Yep. And you have to extend that olive branch one to... Um, come prepared to acknowledge like, here's how I'm probably contributing to this. Cause it's right. one, it's disarming. So it's a smart way to communicate, but two, it's an uh, authentic and honest way. And it shows that you really thought about it when you start approaching the conversation. 
I think people are willing to listen more when they know that you're willing to also commit to a better relationship together. And it's not just asking them to change, but it's a two-way commitment. Yeah, totally. So we then go back in time. So your eight co-founders turn into six co-founders, but nonetheless, there you are building the business. And then you said something else very interesting. So you have your purpose and there's like a give back exp- experience of it. You're obviously, you know, uh, making wine. Obviously, that's part of what, that's, that's your business, what you're doing. And everybody came from the wine sales business, but not really the wine business. So I want to hear like how you kind of cracked into the wine business. And then what's this about Girl Scout cookies? Um, yes, we only knew like 1% of the wine business at the time. Right. How to sell Stocking wine. the shelves. Yes. <laughs> yes. How, you, and how, how to sell wine at a big grocery store, a big box grocery yeah. store where the wine kind of just sh- showed up at the back gate, you know? And there's so much to getting wine all the way to the point where it's arriving at the store. Um, and all the supply chain um, on premise and uh, hotels learning direct to consumer today. Four out of five of our sales channels are direct to consumer. So we were uh, in um, only one uh, channel originally, um, which was into the traditional, what's called the three tier system, where you sell to distributors, the distributor sells to the retailer, and then the retailer sells to the end customer. And in that model, the distributor and the retailer take about 60 cents on the dollar. And wow. so we were like, hey, this um, channel alone is not working for us because we're not big enough to give away that much. Um, and we don't collect a relationship with our end consumer. We're going through two other uh, layers before it gets to the end consumer. And so um, I will come back to, to that. But uh, from the beginning, our model has been to build in some to give back to the community um, since, since the very beginning, um, it's always been core to the company. It started out with 50% of profits. We cl- quickly realized that it is really hard to be profitable in the first hand. So, yeah. A wine company. So we then started to build it in as a percentage of our gross profits. And, mm-hmm. um, and then it ultimately evolved into, uh, becoming, um, simplified to where 10% is given back to the cause of the customer's choice. And 10% is given back to the uh, cause of the host choice. So people host wine tasting events all around the country now, raising money for their cause. Um, So it can be their breast cancer walk or their kid's school or their pet adoption clinic or things like that. Um, And then also all the, any customers that buy wine there, anytime they come back, if they're in the wine club or anything, they can direct their purchase towards their cause of choice ongoing. And so... People have donated to over 40,000 nonprofits um, wow. to this point. And um, when I talked about uh, Girl Scout cookies, um, you know, this community of wine reps that puts on wine tastings all over the country to try to bring our kind of Napa tasting room experience to people's homes and to pop ups and businesses and things like that. Um, you know, I, I thought about us building uh, Girl Scout cookies in the form of the product that kind of had a give back built into them. Um, I I didn't until a few years in think about the actual Girl Scouts and the the local entrepreneur, the cause entrepreneur. And so um, we'll oftentimes refer to our wine reps as cause entrepreneurs, um, people who are uh, building a, a little business locally and giving back to um, causes that are important to them in the community, empowering people to give back by buying a great product. And so that's why, you know, I grew up with my mom being the the head of the Girl Scout troop for my little sister. And she always had tons of Girl Scout cookies in the garage. And I came to find out they sell a billion dollars of these things uh, every year. And they fund, um, you know, little girls um, being empowered with this uh, their initial feeling of entrepreneurship and and the ability to sell and the, even more than that the ability to connect with people to share what they have to offer right and that takes a certain level of courage i got that early on um get, doing surveys in the mall for my mom starting at 12 that was my first job and it and it had the girl scout cookie effect for me you know um, one once you can get someone to stop and do a survey for five minutes you can sell anything to people so I was going to ask you how you built your sales skills, but now I know. <laughs> well, yeah. I was a quiet kid, you know, for 
there was a, a phase where my my mom was actually worried about me because I was a late developer as far as ta- speaking and talking. And then she said I finally um, started talking, and then she couldn't get me to shut up ever. Uh, yeah, I to switch at some point, but I was also um, I was an awkward kid. I was really into math and numbers and things, and um, I didn't really find my voice until um, I started to. Um, kind of go into high school is really when I felt like I um, became uh, a leader in in my voice. And a lot of that had to do with gained confidence of getting bigger and becoming a better athlete and working really hard at um, some of those things. But um, yeah, I think my my ability and and comfort of talking to people really started to evolve when I first started working for her. Um, Yeah. yeah, It it taught me how to approach people and disarm them a little bit. and uh, it's helped because I'm I'm a bigger guy and have a loud voice and stuff. And so that can be intimidating if you don't have control over it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the idea of one, one definition of charisma is power and warmth. And mm. so power in part is also just like physical size and also maybe confidence in how you express yourself. And then the warmth is what you bring to sort of temper that so that people really feel attracted to you. And I must say, when we were out there that weekend, you know, you kind of swept into the farmhouse. And we'll talk about the farmhouse in a minute, but you swept into the farmhouse and you took control and you gave this tour. And there was a lot of, um, you know, it was clear that y- you were really comfortable owning the room. And it sounds like that was not, tr- that was that was an evolving skill from you as you kind of gained in confidence starting in high school and later. Is that right? Yeah, it was definitely developed, not like born into me, I think. Um you know, who knows? It's. I think a lot of things are actually both genetic and environmental. So maybe I was destined to feel comfortable speaking to people, but I took um, public speaking and really did work at um, in, in high school. And I really did work at being able to communicate better to people because I wanted to be able to. Um, there was like this want in, in me as a younger kid and uh, at the same time, I didn't, I didn't find that voice to actually do it until later on. And I feel like a handful of things pushed me to do that. Sports definitely um, helped me find my voice because I was a, a goalie in soccer. So you kind of have to yell out directions to people and stuff like that. And I put myself in the positions and stuff where um, you needed to use your voice a lot more. And so those those things push me to have to bring it out to do the job, you know? And, um, and yeah, like I said, um, I starting to go out and, um, and do surveys and then ultimately grew into, um, doing that and running teams of people. And usually the best people to get a survey in a mall are, uh, older women like grandmas, because people are less likely to turn them down if they come up and say, uh, do you want to take a survey, you know? And so, um, but I started kind of training and developing these people on how to ask that the right way and and disarm people right away and and manage expectations with how much time it would take and what's and what we have to offer them for it. What's the benefit and get to that right away. And so those after doing this and repetition over and over again, I started to see what people reacted to and what what the difference was of somebody shutting me down or or not even looking at you and like turning the other way and dodging you versus what is it that invites people? And I haven't had somebody um, talk about it the way you just did, of like, you know, the confidence um, combined with uh, the warmth. Um, and I, um, I, I do think that that, that combination is, is really important. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like something that you continue to invest in in yourself, that you continue to invest in your communication skills and your confidence skills. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then they get reaffirmed too, because when you go and, do it and you feel good about um, how you presented. And look, I study myself all the time. I'm my biggest mm-hmm. critic. So I'll go and do a talk and people will be like, that was great and high five and stuff. And I know in the back of my head, that was like, uh, that was like a seven out of 10 or something. Yeah. I could have yeah. been more prepared. I could have done better. And that's okay. I, I So I have a standard for myself and I don't always hit my mark on it. Um, you know, I'm not like Simone Biles of, of it, it right. but I'm, um, I'm trying to be, you know, I'm trying to think about it that way. Um, and uh, only so many people are like gifted to be the greatest of all time, but you're trying to, you're trying to chase that, you know? Totally. Yeah. 
So then if we come back to sort of your overall business model, so obviously you you um, sell wine, right? You make wine, you sell wine, you've got a bunch of different lines. And then you also have what it sounds like is you have people, you know, probably ambassadors, you may call them. I'm not sure what you call them, but like there are people who then try to do wine experiences for friends in other parts of the world, not just Napa. And then you also have probably a subscription of some sort. Many, I think that many wine, you know, um, sellers do have that. And then you also have the farmhouse. So am I missing anything? And kind of how do those things all tie together? And is this unique in the wine world? Um, so, uh, yes, it is unique in the wine world. Um, it's, uh, we call it an omni-channel approach in that we have multiple channels, how we connect to people. And we also have a portfolio of wines that's everything from like a for what I consider affordable luxury. So like 25 to $40 price point to, um, you know, $250 plus bottles of, of wine, very limited production, really special stuff. Um, I, I love all of our wines and I'm proud to have any of them, um, uh, at my own dinner table. So that's kind of my baseline, my standard for our, the wines that we sell. And, yep. um, we, uh, so we share wine and give hope through our, what we simplified the name, we call them wine reps. They, they rep our brand, they rep our cause and purpose. And, um, we have thousands of them around the country and we empower them with, um, a platform that includes uh, software that allows them to run their business, their, their own, uh, dashboard and, and business management dashboard, their own e-commerce, uh, site and, uh, their own app and a bunch of other tools that we provide for them. Um, we have uh, a channel where we sell direct to um, co companies um, and do corporate gifting. And we also um, still sell in thousands of restaurants and hotels around the country as well. Um, so those are two other distribution channels. And then of course you can buy us at onehopewine.com um, direct off our website as well. Mm -hmm. uh, our, um, our property is a, uh, separate real estate and hospitality company that was created seven years after starting One Hope, which is really brand distribution technology company. And we have built uh, brands underneath it um, and we built uh, distribution through these different channels and we built te technology and software to power it. Um, when I realized that we need to have a flagship property too and a sense of place for this brand. And if we want to be... Um, the most innovative, iconic, and impactful wine brand of this generation, which is now our vision from the adult version of Girl Scout Cookies to building the most innovative, iconic, impactful wine brand of this generation. That iconic part, um, hey, we need to build something really special and in a region where the greatest wines in the country and some of the greatest in the world have come out of. And so Napa was kind of the obvious spot to look at. And at the same time, I had committed to previous investors, I'm going to build this asset light brand distribution technology company. And this was like the most asset heavy thing you could do by a piece of land right in the heart of Napa. And so I created yeah. a, a new company. Um, One Hope was the first seed investor in it. And um, it's still the largest owner today out of sweat equity and um, started building a community uh, that is now over a hundred people ranging from some of the greatest athletes and musicians of our time to great visionaries and entrepreneurs to really nice families and philanthropists that have all come together to help us build this one of one vineyard destination property that has our flagship winery and then also has a private home on the property. And that home is literally and figuratively the home to our brand at One Hope. And that pro the, the winery is our flagship winery and it sits on our state vineyard. And um, it's a really, really special place um, it allows us to sell uh, some of our um, nicest and most elevated wines. It allows us to build a community and host people uh, in person and bring them together around wine. Every single layer of the company um, serves uh, our mission or empowers our mission, which is sharing wine and giving hope. So um, our, our mission serves our purpose to nourish the future every day. And, um, and we do it at our own property and we do it in people's homes all over the country. And we do it through those other channels as well. We do have a, one more fun um, kind of distribution channel that we're opening up in the coming year um, that I can share about uh, that 
brings the Napa tasting experience to people's hometowns and uh, our location-based experiences that we're going to start. Is this breaking news? Are you going to break news here, Jay? Oh, yeah. yeah, actually, it is breaking news. Um, here we it's, go. Uh, it's a, a urban winery and pickleball clubs um, because... Pickleball, stop <laughs> it. <laughs> of course, of course. Pickleball hope. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, our our founders all really like pickleball and we love wine and we play it at the property and we figured that combination really works. And it's um, it's a great sport. It's the third largest and the fastest growing in the U.S. And it's the largest team sport because it's behind biking and running. And so it's cool. You play it, play it as a team. There's 36 million people playing it uh, regularly right now. And yeah, it's growing. growing every and, day. Yeah. <laughs> and we figured, let's try to take our uh, food and wine experience that we have in Napa and bring it to more parts of the country. So um, we're going to test our our first one um, this next year out of our warehouse down in Orange County. So. Oh, my God. Uh, Wait, so what's the what's the thing? So like your how does pickleball and wine? How, to, what's the offer? Um, the What's offers, the event? Uh, come down and you can play pickleball and other uh, fun things like cornhole and uh, and ping pong and things like that. And uh, you can also stay in, and hang out in our wine garden. That's a uh, really cute tasting area and uh, get food that's, you know, Napa uh, tasting room level food um, out of a food truck <laughs> that we're, uh, we've developed our menu up in Napa and i um, going to bring it down there from uh, uh, our chef on, on property. And so food, wine, activities, um, having a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think people who like pickleball and like wine will love this place and like good food, you know. So. Yeah. And is there, also a, there must be also a, a sort of a giving back component to this as well. Oh yeah, every bottle that's purchased um, and people who sign up the wine club there, uh, it'll work the same way our other channels do, where ten percent of the sales going back to your cause of choice, and they want to be able to do things in the local community where we can um, host nonprofit events and things like that, like we do at the Crockle. I think that's so cool. I mean, I'm just really, I'm, I'm just really reflecting. It's a very tight business model where you got a lot of things going on that all feed each other and. That the essence also is sort of at its core is that people can all feel good about it because of its purpose-driven nature. Yes. Yeah. And I it's, think, in, it's in every, it's in the product itself and it's in every, every distribution channel that we sell through has it woven into it. Yeah. So uh, obviously culture and values are important to you. And, and obviously, right, you know, you should, a lot of founders I coach, just being super honest, I'll say, so do you have values? They're like, yeah, yeah. Um, they're like, um, you know, and f which is great. And I understand that they're not fully connected to their values yet. And that's important. And that can be a journey sometimes, but not you. You're like, to, you know, wake up at three in the morning and you understand your values and you're like ready to spout them off. And I'm just curious, like, how do you make sure that as your business matures and you have all these different channels, these different people at various different levels of employment within your company, how do you make sure everyone stays on the same page about values and what problems have you come across in doing that? Uh, that's a that's a really good question, Elisa. Um, the first thing is getting a framework that's as concise as possible. So when I'm introducing the brand or we're uh, to a new teammate or we're onboarding somebody, um, our purpose is three words, to nurse the future. And it starts with them understanding what we mean by that and also the space it gives it, it gives you on the other side to decide what that means to you because uh, there's a lot of ways to nourish the future and our platform gives you the ability to do most of it um i think that um a, a vision statement um like building the most innovative iconic impactful wine brand of this generation and you know people can butcher the order of those three eyes if they want and it's the same statement um they, as long as they understand like kind of the tenets of what we're trying to realize over the, uh, over the longer future. And then day to day, our missions forwards, share wine, give hope. So it's like giving people a really clear and concise framework first off. Um, and then when we talk about like who we are, um, we're built on hope and rooted in purpose. And th that statement's important to us. 
when we think about how we define leadership and mental toughness, there's definitions of those things. Um, a mental toughness, mental strength, um, which is making the next best decision regardless of the circumstances that you're in. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when we think about values, two of them are in our name. So uh, unity and, and hope and being hopeful. And so um, we, uh, it's easy for people to remember that and then authenticity and empowerment. And so, and, and some follow on of what we mean by each of those. Um, authenticity moved into our value structure a while ago in place of honesty. Um, and it's not like we stopped saying we want to be honest with each other, but there's also like, there's a vulnerability to being authentic and it takes being honest. It takes being vulnerable. It takes connecting. So there's, uh, even more kind of heaped in there. And I think all the best brands in the world are authentic. So I think talking about those things and defining them really clearly for everybody and then showing them with the way that we act to one another and what we show, yes, externally, but also how we service and serve each other internally is really where the rubber meets the road. Cause it's easy to like write those things on the wall and, and, and even say them, but it's harder to follow them and to, um, to serve our purpose every day and to walk the walk with our mission every day. And so when people see you doing them, it reinforces them. And then if you've got them concise and simple, then people are clear on what the vision is. They're clear on what our North Star is and our purpose. And those things end up being what um, guide you. They, they guide you sometimes on who can't make the journey with you just as much as they guide you on who can. Um, and what not to do just as much as what to do every day. Yeah. Are there any, you know, sort of stories about what not to do or, you know, who can't make the journey that you could that you could talk about? Because I think we learn so much just from setbacks. And I'm just curious if, you know, it's it, it sounds beautiful. And again, having experienced that with you in person, I really know that you believe it and own it, but it's never perfect. Right. So yeah. what are some of like the the difficult moments that helped you? recognize and maybe learn a lesson? Well, I've never um, let go of somebody too soon, <laughs> uh, which it is okay. I think that um, that's the side to err on in life. And I, I believe in erring on the side of generosity in general. So, and I'll probably continue to do that. And um, when I miss, I'll kind of miss long versus short. Um, and, uh, when, I mean, it, it does go back to, um, as those things developed and we started to, um, respect them more and say, we're going to actually uphold these. These aren't just like nice things to say. Um, then the, the pressure on, Hey, this is not working out the way that, um, you're talking to your peers. It's that when you manage, you manage down, you manage side to side and you manage upwards. And if you, and if you can only do one or two of those things, um, it doesn't work. You know, you have to be able to do all three of them. If you're a leader, if you're, um, if you're in a position where you don't have to be a leader, we'd love for everybody to be a leader, then, um, you really just need to manage up, meaning, um, you're, you don't have anybody reporting to you, you know, um, I, um, I believe that when I've hit moments where it was uh, time for somebody to go their separate way, it was because one of those directions wasn't working and, uh, you had, you've had the conversations and I've had this before. Um, you, you have, them. you're very, you get more and more clear about them. You get more and more clear about what the repercussions are going to be if it doesn't improve. And then you ultimately, uh, get there at that, at that point. Now in the early days, you'd kind of just bypass all the steps along the way. And, and then it just like come out in a big old like word vomit, you know? And then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I've had, um, I've had times where people thought we were building a different company than we were building. They thought that because of the way I was communicating, and maybe, um, and maybe I thought we were building a different company that at the time, because of the way I was communicating, I realized, oh, this person, um, you know, thinks we're building purely a technology company mm -hmm. and, and we're, we're actually building a brand 
and something bigger than just a uh, technology. The greatest uh, technology companies are brands and they are platforms usually. And so, um, you know, we're building um, a platform for giving and a platform for selling wine um, and sharing wine and giving hope. Um, and at the end of the day, also embracing like first and foremost, uh, we are building a wine brand. And like right now it relates back to building a wine brand and a, and a wine community. Um, and so I think it's easy when you, um, when you aren't giving good direction for people to get off course. And so whenever I found that that's the case, I've tried to say, well, how am I contributing to this? Where's the confusion coming from? And, um, I wasn't always mature enough to do that. So that's, I, it was more like this person's driving me crazy. And like, I can't believe they just don't get it. Um, and, uh, the, the other difficulty of it is that when you build a culture, um, and you build departments, um, you have this overall company culture, but then it kind of does work like the federal and state system is like, you want that, you want the other departments to have their own like subculture and to hang their hat on certain things in the organization. But what starts to happen is you start to have these teams that are like thinking about their individual team uh, or department really, and not the overall team and the brand first. And so one of the things I've had to uh, realize and reinforce more and more is like brand team than the individual. And it's like, that's the, the, the order that serves the individuals the best ultimately is if the brand and team are healthy is like should serve you. But um, culture in today's business world, not everybody comes with that mindset. And so trying to reinforce that as you grow and people are less and less connected to the purpose and to maybe the founding um, values and, and framework of, of what got us here. They come in with a, a an individual type of a mindset of like, how right. does this company serve me? And um, usually that's been where the most difficult, um, the most difficult employee relationships have been is when people are not in line with our purpose um, and they're, um, they're very much about themselves and individual. And I would say that number one um, characteristic of people who don't work out with me and with our company are selfish people. And I've seen it before. Like some, some people are selfish and driven a lot by personal result. Uh, they're driven a lot by personal results. They're amazing contributors. And so there's this trade-off and it's like how, what's your threshold for selfishness relative to how talented somebody is. And yeah. I think Alex was the one that said no brilliant jerks, you know, and I, um, I've met some brilliant jerks in my days and I've, um, and I've tolerated it and, uh, culture, you know, defined as simply as possible is what you tolerate in your organization. Yeah. Now, Jake, can you, there's something going on with your hand or your microphone that's causing a little bit of static. Sorry. Yes. Is that no, okay? much better. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what happened, but much better. I yeah. think that was, uh, that's, we don't have to do that over. That was fine. But I just wanted to prevent that. Yeah. Um, Sorry. And what, what I, what I ended with there, I think is like my biggest learning along the way is that culture is what you tolerate, uh, in your organization. And it's, um, that is what ends up defining it. Like you can talk about what your culture is and stuff, but, um, what's, what's tolerated across the organization ends up kind of being one of the best definitions of what, what your culture is. Totally. And then what have you learned about hiring in light of all that? Um, I've learned that, and this is not new. People have said this before, but I've, um, now really internalized it is a, that you should hire slow and fire fast. And <laughs> I don't think you should fire fast. Really. I think you should, um, oh, that's a really serious thing when you get to that stage and you have somebody's, um, life and their family and the people connected to them. Um, in your hands uh, in a lot of ways. And so doing that in a, the right way is really important. But um, you should uh, you should set a timeline of, of expectations and results from the beginning when somebody's coming in. And if they're not hitting that, then you should have already created a framework and structure for them to understand that these were what the business 
needed um, for this to work and that and to make it as non-personal as uh, possible. Um, and I think that's a really hard thing to do. Non-personal in a business. Come on, every, they, the the essence and the magic of businesses is people. And so totally. you're, trying, you're trying to uh, separate those two with hiring. Um, I think having a lot of people interview the person um, and almost anybody who's going to interact with them regularly is worth the time. And it's and it also makes those people part of that um, choosing process. And I found that anytime I've hired somebody where the people who they were going to manage directly um, or the really important people they were going to work cross-functioning with every day, uh, those people weren't somehow brought into the fold at some point. And either early stage um, in the hiring or at least as a checkpoint by the end of it, um, it's always, almost always been better when th they were part of the process and they gave their sign off too. And so they felt like they were part of it. Everybody likes for, to work on their idea. Uh, that's just the human nature. They, that you let, you get connected to your own personal ideas and, um, people like to be, um, kept in the loop in the process. Even sometimes when you know it's not a good use of their time or their energy, or they're stressed to think about it. And, um, and you have to make those choices as a leader is like, when do you pull people into, can they handle that? If they, if they think they want to know, but do they really want to, or should you not put that on them? And so yeah. with hiring, I think it's worth putting that on people early on. I think, uh, working really hard to find great people pays off a lot. And if you miss and find a bad person, it's very costly. And so just going in eyes wide open that those two things are true is like talent, a really talented person can change the entire business and a really bad person um, can change the entire business. Right, for sure. Is there a favorite interview question that you have or that your team has come up with to, you know, kind of make sure that this person, that people are new cult cultural fits? Um, I'll share a big uh, list of questions that we use uh, from time to time, but my favorite thing to do is to take them out to dinner actually and see oh, how wow. they interact with um, a person who's serving them and that's everything to me and I look back at some of the hires that didn't work out and if I would have just gone to dinner with them uh, I would have um, realized that they weren't the right hire and when you're in hospitality and and grew up the way I did with parents who, you know, both were worked in restaurants when, when my mom was pregnant with me and her and my dad were we're running an Italian joint in Chico at Chico State, you know, um, and I think that was um, always bred into me at an early stage. Um, hospitality, hosting people, and things like that, and then also how you act to people who are in service to you, and um, you can learn a lot about people who um, and how they treat people who are in service to them. Yeah, that's beautiful. Jake, I'm curious how in, in your, you know, decades long journey now as a leader and as a founder, what are some of the ways that you've grown personally as a leader? How I've grown personally is not taking things too personally and sometimes chalking it up to it's just business, you know, um, like I just talked about, it's very personal to me. That brand is very personal to me. It's my baby. But I learned that to, um, to grow that baby, I, I, needed to, uh, I needed to change as a parent, you know, and, yes. and grow with them and, um, and take my hands off a little bit and let it, let it run on its own and let it sometimes even fall on its face and see what that feels like. Um, I've, <clears throat> I've never really, I've never let our, uh, company run off a cliff. Um, but I find that the last five years I've let some of my teammates fall a couple of times to just see what they're made of, you know, uh, resilience and being relentless and figuring it out on your own and starting to be able to learn from mistakes the same way I have and let people, uh, run through mistakes to become better leaders themselves. I've learned was really important. Um, being more transparent 
and letting people be connected to some of the ugly stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And early on, I didn't want anybody to really understand the financials of the business because I always thought, oh, if they saw these financials, they'd be (laughs) scared that they're not going to have a job in like three months. They'd run away. Yeah. (laughs) Then you start to realize you're like, well, if they do run away, are they the are they the right person, you know? And so all of a sudden you start learning that when you're vulnerable and you're transparent, the people who are supposed to be with you and want to build this thing with you and are actually taking responsibility for that number rather than being overly scared about it. um, Those are the people that you want around you. Um, Being more and more authentic with people is a, a, a similar thing that I've seen is um, as I start to talk to people and tell them what I really want to say and and mean versus trying to sugarcoat it or say it in a way that I, how I think they want to hear it um, has uh, been a game changer for me. And um, it's allowed me to feel more authentic uh, too. So just that alone is powerful, but then I think it's been good for my team. Um, Being uh, conscious of the machinery that I have and my capabilities, but also being conscious of how to use them and being more of a technician on how to use my skill sets um, and and understanding what my weaknesses are and getting really deeply in touch with those, which happen to be some of my greatest strengths too, depending on the day and the situation, is, um, is really important. So I, I found that I was... Uh, had a tendency to clap back at my teammates immediately with 100% confidence on certain things and how annoying that was <laughs> and how much it made them feel like belittled and me look like I'm a know-it-all. And um, part of it is just like me and my confidence and excitement about sharing um, something with somebody and feeling like I have the right answer but that overconfidence that I have the right answer when my track record says that I'm not 100% right. I know that surprises people, but um, I've been wrong on quite a few things. Um, And just being a little bit more open-minded, learning that I wasn't being a very good listener and that Mm -hmm. that, that's really one of the biggest keys to being a leader is to like truly listen, not just be thinking about what you want to say next, but listening to people, internalizing and then taking time before I react and um, and have an answer right away um, shows thoughtfulness and um, and a little a little bit less of like a reactionary um, type of a type of leadership style and uh, and a much more thoughtful and intentional one. So those those are some of the learnings I've learned a a, a great deal, and I do feel like I've developed and I I become a stronger leader because I've gone through some stuff, you know, I've gone through hard days. I've gone through the bank account hitting zero plenty of times uh, in my career. I've had my back up against the wall and I've seen that I can, there's almost always a way um, and you just have to be committed to it and getting in touch with a healthy level of fear and understanding and taking myself back consistently to um, being recentered in purpose first and foremost, and why I'm doing this. And also understanding that everything you want is on the other side of fear. And so mm-hmm. and in that like fear, pain, struggle, all of those things, like the other side of those is the trade-off of the greatest happiness, joy, feeling of fulfillment and achievement and purpose that you can find, but it doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come cheap. When was the most recent time that your back was up against a wall? Oh, all throughout the pandemic, really. Um, yeah. The um, at-home wine tastings fell off a, a cliff, of course. Tailwinds of um, social selling and like virtual wine tastings for a hot minute, which was fun and that was a bunch of growth, but we weren't really having in-person connection, which is the ma- magic of our brand. And so all of a sudden all this influx of customers and wine reps and stuff that came in during that time, a lot of them didn't really experience the brand the way that it was before the pandemic. And that, that was really hard in it. At the same time, we had, um, we thought we were going a certain direction and we were trying to pivot towards virtual and we hired in that direction and we put resources in it, we invested in it. 
And then, you know, over the next couple of years, things slowly started to roll back, but you were in no man's land a little bit and depending on what states you were in and all these things. So just having clarity about where we want to invest um, our resources, our dollars and all of that. And um, yeah, there were, there were moments where, um, you know, it wasn't all growth and, and up into the right. It was, it was down into the right. And, um, you know, we're a company that came from 168 cases to a hundred thousand a year now. And we've had a compounded annual growth rate of about 20% annualized for 15 years to get to where we are. But, um, so experiencing, uh, years where you actually lose market share, um, but you're getting more discipline about your expenses and controls and things like that. That's a sign of maturity in the business, even though it's really painful to go through. And when you're, um, when you have less people, um, than you did last year, right? Like that's, that was, that took some getting used to, you know? And so when that slide starts to happen, momentum is a, a wild thing. So, I mean, as recent as the last few years, um, feeling that, and I still, to this day, don't take it for granted where we are. I feel like we're in a much more stable place than we were a little while ago. And I feel like the, um, society's in a little bit more stable place. Yeah. Uh, that sounds funny saying that 60 days before an election helped with tonight, but uh, let, let's see. I'll, I'll take Fingers it. Fingers crossed. So. Exactly. Exactly. Jake, just a couple more questions. What do you wish you had known earlier on your journey? Um, I think that I, I wish that, uh, I, I knew, uh, you know, it's going to turn out all right, no matter where yeah. this twists and turns, it's going to, it's going to be all right. And be present in the moment. This is one of the, be this is one of the best moments it, there's going to be, you know, like this window of time. And, um, I started thinking about that more and that set in when I had a, um, a, a baby and I feel like maybe if I, um, if I understood that feeling and had that reference of time, um, earlier, I would be a, I would have been a different type of a leader. And so I, I have thoughts sometimes about like, would I have started a family earlier with, uh, with my wife? Cause I, I always wanted to have kids early on. And I think I, um, I think I put that off because I thought, you know, I need to focus on this business and I can't do those two things. And I also thought that maybe my calling was to touch like millions of children and to, um, that in the second act of my life or the second mountain, I was going to build, uh, orphanages and do something at scale for kids. And after having a child, um, I had, I think that I'm even more likely to do that. And I, so I think I'm more committed to the purpose that I have and it connects nourishing the future connects even more at the most nuanced level and the most direct level compared to, um, saying it in the past where it was at the biggest, most general level. Now it's at a very specific level. And so, yeah, I think as a leader, um, I, maybe I would have done that earlier because I think it's been so beneficial, but at the same time, no regrets, you know, it's, um, I'm, I'm so grateful for where I'm at and ha having a second child on the way too, which we don't know the, the gender yet. And we didn't with Jack either, but, um, I, uh, I'm thrilled about that. And so everybody's, um, time I think is, uh, is probably meant to be on that, uh, front, but, um, I also, so that's, that's at a personal level, I think. And then at the business level, um, there's a part of me that wishes that I figured out the product market fit and who we were and where we were going and all of that stuff, um, first and then scaled. And I think because we started out with eight of us, we are always bigger than we could afford to be. And so it put an immense amount of pressure on me as the chief executive officer, because my job is to capitalize the company. And when you start out with eight people, they better all be able to pay for themselves quickly. Yeah. You know? And I think we've always um, lived a little beyond our means. Um, but, and, and it's this 
delicate balance uh, because you're trying to build, you're trying to bend reality, right? You're trying to build something out of the dirt that didn't exist before. And we've done that with the property. Um, we've literally built structures out of the dirt that weren't there. And we've done this with this brand that, w that was nothing. And then it became a little seed. And then now it pops up all over in the wild. And um, I think that uh, when people are starting a business nowadays, I'd always caution them of like, keep it lean and keep it to put pressure on unneeded pressure on yourself until it takes a while sometimes to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. I feel like it's easy for me to look back and say that now, but, um, we, we were, uh, just brave enough to go and start this thing and just naive enough to think that we could do it. And so there's something really special about, uh, not not exactly knowing what the future holds and and jumping and and hoping the net will appear uh, along the way and uh, I love that uh, I love that well that gets into the last question I have which you give a little bit of but what advice do you have for other founders as they embark on their journeys to grow into leaders enjoy what you're doing every day F mm. find something that gives you purpose it doesn't have to be fun every day and e and it's definitely not going to be easy every day so that's just like a um, something that isn't real. And even if it was, um, I don't think it would be quite as fulfilling if there wasn't a lot of struggle and challenge that comes. But every great entrepreneur out there will speak of struggle and challenge, and they may not even be able to exactly size it up with this big moment, like you were kind of asking about where there are these, these moments and inflection points, Alyssa. And it's like, no, it's these moments where you wake up and you're on the road and you and you get a shitty email um, in the at 5 a.m. in the morning, and that's how your day starts out, and you're feeling a little bit lonely and down from like an amazing event that you had last night, but now you're on the, the other side of that wave. And um, if it, it's so hard to build something um, over time and something that has lasting power, and uh, even if you have a purpose that you can get recentered in every day. So if you don't have it, it's it's nearly impossible. Um, and great businesses, great brands um, are built by people at the end of the day. And um, like invest in the people that make sure you pick the right people and really invest into them and um, and be loyal to them and work hard for them. Um, and they'll work hard for you and you'll work hard for each other. And um, I, I think the combination of um, people and then, um, uh, like I said, not, um, not over investing early on before you know um, where you're going. Um, and, and at the same time, enjoying the journey, picking people early on, getting it right early on with people that you wanna build with and who on the tough day, if you can't recenter yourself in purpose, um, and, and why you're doing it, they help you get there. And I tell people that all the time that we have a bunch, uh, we have six of us and there are a lot of days where a handful of us were weak on our knees or ready, to, uh, or ready to give up, but there was never a day where all of us were. And so there was always at least one person who was like, no, we got this guys. And so I, I'm a real believer in doing it, um, with other people and having co-founders. Um, and I think that if you, you know, that old saying that if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together, um, it takes, uh, other people to build great things and whether you found it yourself or not, um, it, get some great partners around you, um, and you can build these great things. It's the only way, um, the greatest things have ever been built. So. Beautiful. Jake, what can I say? Breathtaking. Thank you so much for this great conversation and congratulations what you're building with One Hope, which is just really extraordinary. And I'm really looking forward to following your progress. And thanks for joining me today. It was such a good conversation. Thanks, Alyssa. Can I share one more thing about uh, looking back on on the brand? Please. Name? Yeah, please. Our, our, our name, One Hope, is two of the most powerful words in the English language brought together for a single word. And um, it's, it's really special to me that the actual brand and name itself. And I just thought that it stood for what we're doing. I didn't really have a, uh, exact 
definition or reasoning of why it was perfect. It just felt like it. And those two words captured what, what we're doing perfectly. And I came to realize over the last few years as people um, uh, went through a period of time where we weren't able to connect as much in person and that human connection was broken a bit, um, that our, our company early on, I, I thought about you know, our service being wine tastings but I come to realize that our service is really bringing people together and we happen to do it around tasting wine. Um, and I have always thought about our product as being wine, um, but our product is actually hope and it comes in the form of a bottle of wine. And so within our name is both our service and our product. And um, when that kind of came to me, and it was like an aha moment of, that's what one hope is, is bringing people together uh, to give people hope and, um, and, and we do it with wine. And so I hope that, uh, that the people listening and, and others who, who have supported us over the years, um, continue to give people hope by opening up a, a great bottle of wine and, uh, and supporting us. And I do, I also want to just let you know that we bit, built this brand from a public storage unit because of people wanting to help us out and just being like, Hey, I want to share your mission. It's how our wine rep program even started was our friends and family being like, we want to have a tasting event for you and get the word out. And they would host them and, um, you know, they'd be like, where can I buy this? And they'd be like 40 miles down the road, Bob Smith carries the Chardonnay or something, you know? And so yeah. ultimately that grew into this ambassador program, but, um, it really is people like you, um, saying, I really love your story. I like what you guys are doing and I want to help you and I want to share it with people. So thank you for being a part of sharing wine and giving hope. And um, thanks to anybody listening. Um, we're, we're excited to touch people's lives um, through working with every one of you. Thank you, Jake. Beautiful. Thanks again. Thanks, Alyssa. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to From Startup to Grown Up. If you like what you heard, give it a review on Apple Podcasts so other people can find it. And if you know of a founder or someone else who is meant to be on this podcast, drop me a line through my website, alyssacone.com.